Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you joined us today. We've heard and even repeated catchy band-aid phrases that seem comforting and empowering. Phrases like, God helps those who help themselves. Speak your truth. Follow your heart. But did you know the Bible doesn't say any of that? In this study, we'll turn to scripture to expose commonly repeated misconceptions and find freedom and true power in the life-changing truth of God's Word. Would you turn in your Bibles, please, this morning to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. A while back, I came across this book called The Separation of Church and State, which is what the topic today is in this message. It is a booklet by David Barton. It's only 25 pages. I was so impressed with it um, that uh, I've got a whole bunch of them, and we're not going to sell them to you. I'm so impressed, I'm going to give one to you, and you can get them after the service. Uh, we're asking, though, that it's one per family, so if you've got like five people in your family, don't take five copies. Take a copy, read it, and pass it around. And only take one if you're going to read it, but it's for free, you can grab it. It will clear up the issue um, in more detail even than I'm going into today, the separation of church and state. The old saying, as Johnny mentioned, is never discuss politics or religion with polite company. I am gonna violate both of those today And uh, for two reasons. Number one, because it's on your mind anyway. It's election season. Uh, People are asking as believers, should we be involved? If so, how much should we be involved? And second, because there's probably no statement that is more controversial for a Christian in the United States of America than that little phrase, the separation of church and state. Now, most everyone has heard that statement. What I've discovered is most people who have heard that statement do not know the origin of the statement, nor do they really know what that statement originally meant. And because it is so misunderstood, the common thought is this, that people of faith should zip it and not get involved at all intersecting with the political world. That they should keep the cross, that is the church, and the flag, that is the state, totally separated. However, the people that use the phrase the most are not Christians who think the Bible says this. Most of them are unbelievers who think the Constitution says this. By the way, neither are true. This is not found in the Bible uh, per se, nor is it found in the Constitution. I'll get to that in a moment. But most people think it is in the Constitution, that it is constitutionally prescribed as a mandate that religious people, people that have a faith voice, should stay out of the public life and just let secularists run the government. So what has happened is the separation of church and state has now come to mean the separation of the church from the state, that we dare not bring our beliefs into the public square. Now I say that's chiefly the secularists. However, they're not the only ones. I'll give you a personal example. A few years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. for a prayer rally And I had the privilege of being invited to the White House during the previous administration into the Oval Office to pray for the president. And I did. Afterwards, and there was a small group of us, we were invited to stay by the president to attend a ceremony in the Rose Garden where the president was going to nominate someone who is now a Supreme Court justice, her name, Amy Coney Barrett. It was her nomination in the Rose Garden. We were invited to stay. We did stay. And um, it was an event that was publicized on news channels. And some people saw me on a news channel in the Rose Garden at the White House. They were members of this church. And they were so angered that I was there that they decided, we're leaving the church. 
because I guess pastors shouldn't be seen publicly, especially in the Rose Garden, especially praying for a president of the United States, maybe particularly that president. So I'll just say this. I'll go on record as saying, I will pray for any president or any candidate of any party if they ask me to pray for them. I feel that's my biblical mandate. You say, well, you, you haven't been seen praying for this president and this administration. Well, I haven't been invited. I would if I got invited. Now, one of our struggles certainly is to balance our responsibility between the church and the state, the cross and the flag, God and government. And I brought you to a passage. It is a passage that is a story that is rendered three different times in the synoptic gospels. I've taken you to the gospel of Mark because in this little paragraph, there is a clash. It is a clash between government over an issue of tax law and God's laws. Let's look at it in Mark chapter 12. We'll begin in the 13th verse. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. That is, you don't play favorites. For you do not regard the person of men but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now what I'd like to do this morning is give you three words. Three words that I think describe the relationship between the church and the state, between God and government, between God's people and our responsibility to the government. And the words are simple, complexity, policy, and responsibility. First is the word complexity. The church has always had a complex relationship when it comes to the government and government issues. And that is because some governments are lenient, some governments are not. Some governments are very oppressive and harsh toward people of faith. Others are very open and very lenient. And one of the reasons we have a complex relationship when it comes to government is because we would say politics is antithetical to Christian values. If you think of it, In politics, you have an adversarial relationship between two opponents vying for power, using propaganda to demonize the other opponent to win the race. And that creates a lot of tension. And we as Christians, we don't like that kind of tension. We're adverse to it. It makes us uncomfortable. Uh, In Christianity, we all meet together at the foot of the cross. We are to be peacemakers. We are to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, going back to our text, we notice in the first few verses of the paragraph that I read, it says, they sent to him. They, we don't know who they are yet, sent to Jesus some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him at his words. Well, let me tell you, they are the religious elite, those who are in positions of power in Judaism at Jerusalem they being the Sanhedrin, the chief ruling body. They sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. This is a plot. It is a plot to trap Jesus, to turn people, hopefully, against him, to reverse his favorability ratings, which are soaring. And so what this does is it highlights the tension between these two groups that are mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit about them in a minute, 
but it shows you the tension between these two groups and the Roman government, which was a totalitarian regime at the time, and Jesus himself. Now, there's always been a tension, as I mentioned, between religious groups and governments. Religious people generally view governments skeptically. But did you know that governments generally view religious people skeptically as well? Uh, Christians in the Roman Empire were certainly viewed skeptically because Christians were so different than the average Roman citizen. They would have their own private meetings. Uh, They would not worship the emperor, which was a law to do so. And they took communion. You say, oh, I don't understand. They took communion. They broke bread and they drank wine. And they said that represented the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We know that as communion. But that was misunderstood by many in the Roman government who believed that Christians get together and eat people, that they are cannibals. That was the rumor going around the empire. Christianity is a group of cannibals. Well, this complex relationship reached fever pitch during the reign of Emperor Trajan, around 249 AD to 251 AD. Trajan demanded absolute allegiance and conformity to the imperial cult. What that meant is everyone had to make a sacrifice to the pagan gods. Everyone had to put a pinch of incense on the altar and say the words, Caesar is Lord. Once they did this, they were given a certificate, a libellus, it is called. A libellus was a certificate saying you had done your civic duty. Well, many Christians wouldn't do this for obvious reasons. Caesar is not my Lord. Jesus is my Lord, they said. But because of that, they were killed. And because they were killed, Some Christians, in fact, some clergymen actually stood in line to pay tribute to the Roman gods to say Caesar is Lord so that they wouldn't face death. Now, let me put this on pause for just a moment and talk generally about government. Did you know that government was given to us by God originally? It's one of the three institutions God gave to humanity. The first being family, the second being government, the third being the church. All three have very different roles. But in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God established mankind to have authority over the creation in a governmental sort of rule. We call this common grace. Common grace is a term theologians use to describe blessings given to humanity by God short of salvation. So common grace would be things like air, beauty, health, natural capacities, and government. Government is part of God's way of restraining evil in a fallen world. With government comes law. With government comes a police force or a military force, a court system. Now think of what your life would be like without any government at all. I know some of you are thinking, it sounds like heaven to me. Actually, it wouldn't be. It would be pandemonium. It would be very difficult to have any kind of safety at all in a society without a government. Anyone could take anything they wanted from you. Anyone could kill you, all without repercussion. So government is a gift of God. But here, this group is trying to trap Jesus to capitalize on this tension, this complexity. And I love verse 15. They said, shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy. You know, you don't mess with somebody who can read your mind. Who knows your thoughts? They don't know who they're dealing with. They're trying to trap him. He knows their motives. He knows their evil intentions. He knows their thoughts. In fact, in Matthew's rendition of this very same story, Jesus says, you hypocrites. Why would he dare call them out like that? Because he knew that this argument that they are bringing of should we pay taxes or not was simply a smokescreen. That behind the little question was a whole different set of evil motivations. 
So this was a straw man argument. And when I hear people cry separation of church and state, I know what they really mean, many of them. What they really mean is they want to silence our faith. They want to keep Christians quiet. Christians, you shouldn't be involved in government at all. What they should do is study a little bit of the words of the founding fathers who actually invited people of faith to weigh in on government issues. And the idea of separation in church and state wasn't that Christians don't interfere with the government, but as was said articulately in the video, that the government shouldn't mess with church stuff. Now this phrase, the separation of church and state, some people think is in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Not only is it not in the First Amendment of the Constitution, it's not in the Constitution at all. The First Amendment to the Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The reason that was written is they did not want a repeat in this country of what they came from in England. They did not want the legal establishment by a government to establish a religious denomination, i.e. the Church of England. So the First Amendment was written. You say, well, then how did this phrase, the separation of church and state, become such a big deal? Well, what happened is... Thomas Jefferson, the newly elected president at the time, was sent a letter by a group of people, a group of Baptist leaders, the Danbury Baptists from Danbury, Connecticut, and they were worried about the First Amendment. They were worried about the Constitution. And what worried them is that because religious protection, religious freedom was written into law, i.e. the First Amendment, that they thought people are going to believe that religious freedom is because of man's gift to them rather than God's gift to them. Instead of seeing it as a right from God, people are going to say, oh, this is a right given to you by the government. That bothered them. So Thomas Jefferson, the newly elected president, wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist. Here's a portion of that letter. And we'll put it on the screen so you can read along if you'd like. Quote, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Notice, the wall of separation that Jefferson is mentioning is to keep government from interfering with expressions of faith. He didn't want the state to influence the church or to tell the church what to do. That's the wall of separation. Now, those who cry the loudest about separation of church and state were some of the very ones that violated that under COVID, saying, marijuana dispensaries, that's an essential business. Liquor stores, that's an essential business. Churches, not so essential. And they interfered with church business, violating the First Amendment. So I think we can all agree that when it comes to this issue, there is complexity. The second word is policy, policy. Now in verse 13, there are two groups that are mentioned. Did you see them? Pharisees and Herodians. They represent two very different positions, two very different set of policies, even political policies. Let me tell you what they were. The Pharisees were strict Jews, as most of you know. They hated the Roman government because the Roman government subjected the Jews to them. The Jews were essentially a, a slave vassal nation to Rome, so the Pharisees hated them. They didn't hold political offices. However, they did hold great political influence 
because they were essentially a state-funded religion, like the Church of England. Then there's the Herodians, opposite spectrum, opposite end of the spectrum from the Pharisees. The Herodians were politically inclined Jews who believed in submitting to the Roman government through the reign of the Herod family, thus the name Herodians. They thought, we should just submit to Rome, do what they say, you know, submit to the laws of the land for political expediency. Well, these two groups hated each other, hated each other. So it's funny, really, that they're together. Like, let's get together on this. Because though they hated each other, they hated Jesus more. And that was their common bond, is their hatred for Christ. And so they get together. And they come up with this policy concern about taxes. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay, verse 15, or shall we not pay? Now, I've discovered nobody likes taxes. Is that an understatement? Do you enjoy paying taxes? You do it, but do you enjoy it? No, but you know that it's necessary. They pay for roads. In those days, they paid for aqueducts. They pay for military. They pay for police. And uh, all sorts of services that we enjoy are from our tax dollars at work. But in funding Rome with their taxes, and the Pharisees knew this, especially, they are funding their own oppression. They are paying with their funds money for Rome to oppress them. And so many of them refused to pay their taxes. And they knew it was a controversial policy issue, so they bring it to Jesus. Okay, Jesus, what do you say? Taxes or no taxes? <laughs> no matter how he answers this, there's going to be problems. That is, if it's a yes or no answer, if it's a binary answer, it's going to be a problem. If Jesus were to say, yes, pay your taxes, well, that's going to anger the Pharisees, and they're going to call him a Roman sympathizer. If Jesus says, no, you shall not pay taxes, the Herodians are going to charge him with treason, and it's going to be a real problem. So it's a catch-22. It's a, it's a heads, I win, tails, you lose kind of a question. It's sort of like the question I was asked four years ago by uh, many people, should I get vaccinated? No matter how I answered that, I would be in trouble with somebody. So typically I would say, well, go home and pray about it and find out what God wants you to do. When it comes to involvement, you heard Johnny Moore in the video say that only half um, of Christians will vote. Actually, that comes from a George Barna poll that was done recently. He said, voter involvement is at an all-time low. One half of Christians say they will not vote. When asked why they won't vote, 68% will just simply say, well, I don't like politics. 57% will say it's because I dislike both presidential candidates. Me too. So, what do you do if you don't like either candidate? Here's what you do. Don't vote personality, vote policy. You're voting platform. We have two very different candidates for president, but they're not the only ones on the ballot. There are many other issues. But two completely different personalities, and I've discovered people say, well, I don't like his personality, or I don't like her personality. Listen. I'm not looking for a Messiah. I have one, thank you. I'm not looking for a savior. I have one. I'm not looking for a pastor in chief. I'm looking for a commander in chief. And when you go into the voting booth, you are not just voting for one person. Thousands of people are going to go to Washington and implement an agenda of some kind, policies of some kind. So that's why the second word is policy. Vote, not personality, vote policy. So we have two words, complexity, policy. I'll give you a third word for this, and that is responsibility. And that comes from the last two verses in the paragraph. They brought the coin, and Jesus said, whose image is on this? Whose mug is on this coin? And they said, it's Caesar's mug. 
Jesus answered and said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Please notice that Jesus did not say, Okay, here you have a coin that represents the government. Be disengaged completely and do nothing. He did not say that. He gave a command, and the command, the positive command, is to render. And it's a very simple, pithy statement that is so profound, there's more than meets the eye. It is a foundational statement. I would even say it's a one-sentence biblical view on the relationship between God and government, religion and politics, church and state. There's two parts to the statement. Part number one, man has an earthly responsibility. Part number two, man has a heavenly responsibility. Look at the word render. If I were to ask you, what do you think the word render means? I wonder what you would tell me. Many of you would say it means give. Give to Caesar. That's how even some translations will say give to Caesar. It's not what it means. It actually means give back. Give back. It implies debt that you owe something. Give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give back to God what belongs to God. So, yes, in effect, it's right to pay taxes to Caesar because taxes belong to Caesar's domain. Give them back. But render to God what belongs to God. Caesar has right to collect taxes, certainly, but Caesar has no right to collect worship. Caesar has no right to regulate or demand worship. Only God is worthy of that high and lofty command. We give allegiance, total allegiance to him, and only God can regulate our worship. In that, that kind of separation is good. So, should Christians be involved in politics? Well, let me ask you a question, if you're still wrestling with that. Should only atheists run this country? Should we let only secularists run this country? Should we just, well, just whatever happens, I'm not going to do anything, and then, and then just submit to the laws of the land? I don't think that's a great tact, especially when you consider that 52 of the 55 founding fathers had some claim to being biblical Christians. And George Washington, our first president, even said, if anyone tries to keep religion and morality from public life, that man is not a patriot. And let me ask you this, America aside, do you know any people in the Bible who were involved in the political process? I can think of a few. Joseph comes to mind first, second in command in Egypt, eventually. I think of Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Queen Esther in Persia. How about John the Baptist in the New Testament who spoke truth to power? It cost him his head, but he didn't back down. Listen, you are not loving your neighbor if you stay out of the process. You are not rendering to Caesar what belongs to Caesar if you stay out of the process. And some will just sort of resign and say, well, you know, whoever gets in charge, I'm just going to submit to governing authorities. Yes, we should submit to governing authorities. Yes, I know Romans 13. But guess what? You live in America. You get to actually choose the governing authorities that you submit to. If you don't think politics affects the gospel, go to North Korea. If you don't think politics affects the gospel, go to Saudi Arabia. I've been there. If you don't think politics affects the gospel, go to Iran. I haven't been there, have no real desire right now to go. Or places like Nigeria, Afghanistan, Myanmar, Libya, Yemen, on and on. There is no First Baptist Church of Pyongyang. There is no Calvary Chapel of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. There is no Presbyterian Church in Tehran, Iran. You know why? Because politically they've been ruled out. And you will say, yeah, but you know, we as Christians should just preach the gospel. Well, I agree with you, and I I disagree with you. I agree with you, we should preach the gospel. But we shouldn't just preach the gospel. That's not a minimal thing. If you are indeed preaching the gospel faithfully on a daily basis, I applaud you, but 
If you don't get involved, soon you will lose the very ability to preach the gospel because that window is closing fast in the West. Let me take you to something that happened just uh, this week in England. Second time I've heard about it happening in the last couple of years. I think more than what I have seen has happened. In England, Adam Smith Connor was arrested and convicted for a crime. Want to know what his crime was? He stood silently in front of an abortion clinic and bowed his head and prayed silently. He was arrested and convicted. What's his crime? A thought crime. You can now go to jail in England for thinking the wrong things. You don't think that kind of ideology is coming to this country? It's already here and it is growing. Then there are also judges on the ballot, not just candidates, but judges on the ballot. You should find out who they are and what they stand for and if you want to retain them or not. You don't think your vote matters for that? Shouldn't Christians care about people? Shouldn't Christians care about how they're treated by their government and how judges rule? Don't you think Christians should care about things that affect gender and marriage and how their children are being educated? We have a voice, we should use it. So in closing, in the few minutes I have, there are several different juxtapositions or relationships that the cross can have to the flag. And by the word cross, I mean the church, and by the word flag, I mean the state. Some people put the flag above the cross. The flag is more important than the cross. What matters most is my political party. That's Nazi Germany. In Nazi Germany, Christianity really was obliterated. The gospel became politics. There were pastors who even said, why should we worry about the miracles of Christ? Let me tell you about the miracles of Hitler's Germany. That's putting the flag above the cross. But then some will place the cross alone without the flag. That is, I will not get involved in anything going on in this world, nothing political whatsoever. The pietists tried that in Europe a few centuries ago. They wanted to completely disregard the secular world. In fact, there were European princes who paid pietist preachers to educate their congregations to stay out of the prince's business. Well, our founding fathers thought you should be involved in the prince's business. Then, number three, some will pit the cross against the flag. That is, whatever the government says, I'm going to be against, because the government's always wrong and always godless. Now listen, there is a place for that. There was a place for that, for example, with Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany, who believed we cannot go along with the government or its policies, we have to oppose the state. And there may come a time when we do that. Number four, some people put the cross with the flag. Now you say, well, that sounds pretty good. But what I mean by this is these are genuine Christians, but they also identify as much with their political party as they do with Christ. And sometimes the issues get blurred and they combine Christianity and a political agenda and they shove it hard. I think number five is the best recourse and that is the cross above the flag. Certainly the flag is there, but the cross is first. The gospel is always first. The answer is Christ not a politician. There are problems in this country that no elected official can ever solve. Only a spiritual revival can solve. So I place the cross first above the flag. But though I don't think that America is the answer for the world, I do believe America is worth preserving. And I'll tell you principally why. I've traveled the world and I've met missionaries and I ask about their support. And 99% of the time, it's from American Christians. 
American Christians are the most generous Christians on the planet and have the wherewithal to fund gospel work around the world. And so I believe that America is worth preserving. I'm grieved when people trash our country. I'm grieved when people burn our flags and say disparaging thing, things against our country. So let me boil it down to a simple takeaway point. In the midst of the complexity we have a responsibility to look past personality and vote for biblical policy. Biblical policy. Enter the voting booth with that in mind. With that in mind, I, in the midst of the complexity, have a responsibility to look past personality and vote for policy. What are the policies? How do they line up with my biblical convictions? Father, thank you that we do live in a country that invites our involvement. It is not a perfect country. We don't think it is your answer to the world. We believe Jesus is the answer to the world. And only a spiritual revival will heal the deep wounds in the world and certainly in our country. But we thank you for the country in which we were born and thank you that we can be involved and pray, Lord, that we as believers would be responsible to both preach the gospel and to follow our civil duty. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We'd love to know if this teaching impacted you. Share your story with us by emailing calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church.